For our next session, we're joined by our partners at Joint Special Operations University to hear about the role of Special Operations Forces in Ukraine. Could not be a more timely discussion. This panel will be moderated by uh, Colonel Ike Wilson, a PhD, who's president of Joint Special Operations University. He's also a senior fellow with the New America's International Security Program and a professor of practice at Arizona State. Um, so first, we'll hear a little bit about Joint Special Operations University and then uh, well, uh, Colonel Wilson will we'll pick it up. According to some, the conflict in Ukraine marks the transition to the fourth age of SOF. While maintaining the counterterrorism and counterproliferation proficiencies we have acquired over the past two decades, or the third age, we must now rebalance and strengthen capabilities to focus on strategic competition with peer competitors. Special operations and conventional forces are learning from Ukraine what the future battleground might look like and a thematic story is emerging. The power of establishing and employing partnerships among U.S. partner and ally nations through diplomatic, development, and defense initiatives are essential to securing democracies and countering global Chinese and Russian malign influences. By banding together to support Ukraine's fight to maintain its territorial sovereignty and national defense. The United States, along with its partners and allies, has sought to communicate and clearly display resolve for promoting a rules-based international order. The conflict in Ukraine is a case study of probable conflict scenarios we will see in the future, confrontations that seek to test the U.S. and partner and allies' willingness to respond. SOF provides our nation's leaders unique capabilities to compete in the gray zone and to deter or defeat adversarial actions by our rivals below the threshold of war. As a uniquely qualified and low provocation foreign policy tool, they routinely integrate with country teams in joint, interagency, intergovernmental, multinational, and commercial or GMC partners to achieve objectives. As the conflict in Ukraine continues to unfold, let us reflect on SOF's contributions with a critical eye. What have we learned, not most about our adversaries, but about ourselves? We must observe closely, assess, and adapt quickly and we must expect that our peer competitors are doing the same. Peter, and I wanna thank uh, first and foremost, uh, all of you participating uh, worldwide in this virtual uh, future um, security forum uh, and uh, my co-sponsors uh, for this year's event, uh, New America, um, Arizona State University and uh, the Army, U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute. My name is uh, Dr. Ike Wilson. I'm the president of the Joint Special Operations University or the JSAL. And it is indeed my pleasure to serve as a, a moderator for what promises to be a dynamic and exciting um, uh, back to our futures look from the, from the tragic but educationally beneficial if we, if we take the lessons uh, forth writ. Uh, of what's going on in and around um, the Ukraine today in terms, in terms of the war itself. Um, I have a great, we have a great panel and set of ground truth experts who will be speaking with us today. If you'd allow me, I'd like to just give them right up front um, a brief introduction in the order in which they'll speak. Our first two panelists will be speaking with us for about eight to 10 minutes in a pre-recorded session, and they'll be speaking to us as a command team. So with us today, and again, our panel is titled, What is the Role of Special Operations Forces in Ukraine? Signaling the Future. And we'll begin with, again, a pre-recorded uh, set of remarks from uh, the Special Operations Command Europe team, Major General Stephen G. Edwards, Spe Commander of Special Operations Command Europe, or SOC Yor, uh, Command Master Chief Pete Musselman, who is the Command Senior Enlisted Leader, Special Operations Command Europe, also known as SOC Yor, and then after their um, pre-recorded uh, comments, we'll go to live virtual uh, with an additional two panelists. Major General Retired Michael Repass, who is NATO Strategic Advisor for Special Operations Ukraine. He is former Deputy Commander of Special Operations Command Europe and former Commanding General of the United States Army Special Forces Command. And then we'll round out with Ambassador Retired Greta C. Holtz, who is Chancellor of the College of International Security Affairs, National Defense University, and former Senior Foreign Policy Advisor, also we call, uh, referred to as a POLAD, uh, to the Commanding General of United States Special Operations Command. Again, it's my pleasure to be a, a moderator with you. And if I could ask my friends to roll the pre-recorded uh, session, we'll get word 
from Ground Truth from the command team at SOC UR. Good afternoon. I'm Sergeant First Class Kelly Simon, the Public Affairs NCOIC at Special Operations Command Europe, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our command team, our Commander, Major General Stephen Edwards, and our Senior Enlisted Leader, Command Master Chief Pete Musselman. Let me first start by saying today, uh, thank you to Arizona State University, the JSAL, New America, and Army War College SSI for bringing us all together today to talk about this important subject on Special Operations. Okay, as we're all aware, since 9-11, uh, soft forces have been used in many ways for the counterterrorism or counter-VEO fight. Uh, with the changing dynamic within the strategic environment, we are now going to be transitioning ourselves uh, not completely away from the counterterrorism or counter-VEO fight, but more towards strategic competition. So we'd also like to talk about uh, the efforts that uh, SOF has done with uh, Ukraine uh, since the unprovoked uh, annexation of Crimea and portions of, of eastern Ukraine. So our efforts since 2015 have been largely focused on transitioning Ukrainian soft from the former Soviet model uh, like Spetsnaz to a more uh, Western NATO inter interoperable soft force. So to get started, gentlemen, what kind of training did Sakyur do with the Ukrainian armed forces pre and post invasion? So I think one of the key things to understand following the initial invasion by Russia into Crimea back in 2014 is that we did stand up the Joint Multinational Training Group Ukraine, where we brought together allies and partners inside Ukraine to train up Ukrainian armed forces. And obviously we played a role in that as well. The, the key thing for that was, is obviously did a lot of tactical level training uh, to support them with small arms training, close quarter battle, etc. cetera. Um, but, one of the key aspects of this is we really uh, built relationships that we are now able to lean on today where we are no longer co-located with the force. Yeah, I think uh, one of the key programs we created was uh, a Q course uh, to force generation model for the Ukrainian soft, much like uh, U.S. Uh, Army Special Forces and their Q course. We're, we're, right, we were dealing with a force that had been uh, built largely like the, the Russian Army, right? It was Warsaw Pact. Um, and their soft forces were modeled you know, exactly like uh, Russian Spetsnaz. So uh, right off the bat, you know, the challenge was how do we start changing their mindset? They had no NCO core. How do we, uh, you know, infuse NCO core in, into their way of thinking? Um, how do we change their formations? Um, everything from how they do mission command, from less structured to more, uh, you know, mission type orders, and, and delegating responsibility to, to their uh, lower level commanders. Another big uh, uh, thing that we started doing was incorporating Ukrainians into our multinational exercises. Um, you know, one of our, our goals was to make them uh, NATO soft interoperable. So bringing them on exercises, bringing them to particular training events where they could be evaluated and graded on how they've changed and how they've matured as a force, I think has been great in in maturing them and getting to getting them to where they are today. With the invasion of Ukraine by Russia, uh, the United States policy has been that no U.S. forces can be inside of Ukraine. Therefore, what we have done uh, within Sakhir and again for the greater U.S. military is we've transitioned to conducting our training outside of Ukraine with our allies and partners, as well as remote advise and assist. So. As you can imagine, this presents uh, some, some unique challenges for us, uh, where previously we were able to interact with our, our, our Ukrainian partners on a daily basis. We now find ourselves having to communicate via remote devices, uh, telephones, computers, um, so that adds another level of complexity. Um, additionally, they're in the middle of a fight and asking soldiers to come out of the country uh, to do training, as you can imagine, would be challenging. Fortunately, there are some of our allies and partners that are able to continue to operate inside of Ukraine. So we rely heavily on them to make sure we truly understand what the truth is on the ground. I think it's key to note uh, when you look at what uh, has occurred or transpired within Ukraine since the initial invasion by Russia, is that I think maybe to many surprise, uh, the Ukrainians have been very, very successful, which I think is truly a testament to the quality of training that not only the U.S. SOF, but all of uh, our allies and partners provided to the Ukrainians. How has Sakyur seen Ukrainian SOF develop and what kind of progress have they made? 
Since the initial attack by Russia inside Ukraine on 24 February, we have seen the Ukrainian SOP be very, very effective against blunting the initial uh, Russian attacks, and we still continue to see them be very effective today in deep strikes inside of Ukraine. Yeah, additionally, you know, as, uh, as the invasion unfolded, we saw the creation of resistance forces and territorial defense forces within Ukraine. And I think Ukrainian SOF has, been a, has played a key role in helping to get those organizations stood up and helping them be effective. What changes is the SOF community making to address future threats? I think one of the key takeaways or lessons learned that we have for our support uh, through the JMTGU into Ukraine is how important it is to get into these countries or any of our uh, allies or partners countries as early as possible so we can start building upon their competencies as well as build those relationships so we can lean on those later on in the future. Something that we obviously are continuing to do today even though we are not co-located inside the country with our Ukrasov uh, partners. I think another key aspect is uh, the resistance operating concept that we developed here at Sokior. Um, it was in the infant stages of, of coming to fruition within Ukraine. Um, had we had a few more years uh, to fully develop that out, I, I think it would have been helpful. So uh, as, we, uh, as we move into the future um, and we work with other nations that could potentially be threatened by a larger neighbor, I think working on the, those resistance and comprehensive defense uh, concepts uh, will be key. So since the invasion of Ukraine, have you found any training shortfalls that Sakir is looking to address or, or improve in the future? Yeah, so th that's the challenge. What would we do differently? Yeah, again, I, I, I don't, I think it's, you, you've got to, right, we, we train and we rehearse and we practice being there with our, our partners. Yeah, and I think and we've got to figure out how, how do we be more effective when there's the time space distance that we have to deal with. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, what we have trained throughout our careers is we train, advise, and assist by, with, and through our partners. The challenge is with has been taken away from us right now. With is being done remotely. Biggest, one of the biggest challenges we have right now is the fact that we're not co-located with, yeah. with our partner, right? Yeah. So we're having to do remote advise and assist. Yeah. Now, we have come up with some unique uh, means to try to do this uh, electronically. But unfortunately, those have not proved nearly as effective as actually being co-located with our partner. This can stem from things such as training. You know, who is going to actually conduct the training? Instead of actually conducting training inside the country, we have to pull the individuals out of the country and, uh, and to, to conduct the training, often relying very heavily on our allies and partners to do that. Additionally, uh, trying to get equipment and resourcing into our partners has proved to be very, very difficult as well especially with the logistics to actually move it from one country inside Ukraine. I think another key point is, is just the intangibles of, of not being there with them and, you know, not understanding that, you know, the, the daily challenges they have, what the environment's like on the ground, um, you know, trying to figure out how to support them when you don't have that level of detail is also uh, extremely challenging. I think it is much more difficult now to communicate with our uh, with our allies and partners. You got to realize, you know, prior to the invasion inside of uh, Ukraine by Russia, we had daily interactions with uh, with their forces, and so to sever that tie to what we have now, and where we're able to talk, you know, maybe daily uh, or you know every other day via phone or uh, video teleconference, is good, but it's not nearly the same as what we had before. So those are some huge obstacles that we're having to overcome. Yeah, it, it, eight years of persistent presence, you know, with a, with a partner, right? You can't replicate that remotely. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us today. Is there anything else that you would like to share? Okay, so I would just like to say, uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, with all of you today. And, you know, we're very proud of the Ukrainian Armed Forces for what they've been able to do. And obviously we believe that's due in some part to what we have done through the JMTGU uh, over the last several years. But again, it's really due to the will uh, of, the, of the people inside Ukraine that I think is making them be so effective. Yeah, I mean, this is, a, this is the proverbial David and Goliath scenario, right? And David's holding his own pretty good right now. So um, I think that's a testament to everything the allies and partners have done the last eight years. 
So first, let me just let me just quickly thank um, our command team at SOCUR, uh, Major General Steve Edwards and Command Master Chief Pete Musselman for exactly as we've promised, um, a voice from the commander, from the, from the senior enlisted leader, from or as close as we can get uh, to the field of action. We'll get to that last piece. I mean, if we if we understood anything, uh, uh, both uh, both senior leaders put on the table uh, the, the good and, ba and the bad and potential the ugly of what it means to do some of this relationship um, uh, activity, uh, train, advise, and assist uh, remote and, and through an indirect approach. So I'm sure we'll be uh, talking about that, if not among the panelists here, uh, certainly in Q&A and discussion. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to, uh, um, to uh, General uh, Repass. Uh, sir, you've got uh, eight, 10 minutes. We're actually a little ahead of schedule, uh, unbelievably, whenever you have uh, Ike Wilson online here. Um, but over to you, sir, and then uh, we'll round out with, with our resident diplomat, um, uh, Ambassador Holtz. Thank you so much, Ike, and it's a privilege to be here today. I want to focus on the future implications of uh, what's going on in Ukraine. And there'll be three focus areas. The first one is the conflict's implication on Ukrainian saw. The second is the implications for the Indo-PACOM region. And the third will be the implications for the U.S. and NATO. So first to the conflict's implications for Ukrainian SOF. In the U.S. and, and primarily in, uh, in U.S. Special Operations Command uh, and certainly within Ike's uh, Joint Special Operations University, we're talking about the fourth age of SOF. Well, in Ukraine, it, it will enter its third age of SOF in the post-conflict era, era. The first age of, of Ukrainian SOF is under the Spetsnaz uh, uh, construct, first under the Soviets, then independently until they made a clean break from the Russians in 2014. The second age of Ukrainian SOF is from 2014 until now or till post-conflict time. Uh, and they're fighting with the SOF that they have which heavily incorporates the Western tactics and capabilities that, that we have given them, not only the U.S., but a very heavy dose of uh, uh, NATO interoperability as well. The Western shift and reform processes that were begun in 2014 uh, were incomplete, however, when the war broke out. So we'll be coming back to that, I think, as we go and move into the, or we see them move into the third age, uh, which is the post-conflict soft that will strongly reflect their experiences in combat. Who among us uh, can say that what they are doing is all wrong because they've been pretty darn successful? So it's going to be difficult to advise them per se. Uh, we should be there more to facilitate and aid them uh, and say some of those things won't work in the larger context of uh, uh, coalition operations uh, because we have state-on-state -state conflict. So there's some there's some, a general outline, if you will, for the third age of Ukrainian soft. First, they may not be like us or NATO soft. Rather, they may be some type of hybrid force with two core tasks, as I see it. The first one is to be able to directly support national and territorial defense, like they've done so well up to this point. And the second one, which is the bit of the mystery of what's going on in Ukraine uh, and elsewhere, is that the whole uh, Russian critical capabilities at risk. And doing both either unilaterally or in combined operations with partners. In combination, these two core tasks will create opportunities for the Ukrainian armed forces and other security forces uh, fighting their enemies, primarily the Russians. The second thing is it, it will create operational strategic conundrums for the Russians uh, when they go deep. There are some key aspects to this, and I'll just uh, enumerate them. First, uh, soft may be different uh, from what is currently in the Ukrainian Armed Forces, and perhaps with closer ties with the Ministry of Interior's SVU Alpha and the Director of Military Intelligence, uh, GER. Second, uh, there's something else uh, will reflect the enduring and distinct value of soft. I don't think that's going to go away. I think it's inherent in the way we do business through assessment and selection and in employment. Third, we'll have, uh, uh, they will have to be capable of integrating diverse capabilities and forces 
into Ukrainian national defense. Uh, and I'll talk about that specifically here in a moment. And then defining their range of organic capabilities will have to include training and leading partners and irregular forces. This goes back to the re, uh, uh, resistance operating concept in their term of asymmetric defense forces. They'll have to organize and support resistance movements in their forces, incorporate allied and partner soft into their uh, formations and operations, and then finally conduct unilateral and combined operations into, into hostile, denied, and foreign territory. Shifting now to the second major implication, and that's that's into the Indo-PACOM region. Look, I, I, I think it's a, a matter of fact, a statement of fact, that China and Taiwan are both closely watching what's going on in Ukraine. There are some strategic implications worth noting. The role of resistance in national defense is highlighted. The roles of soft in national defense are highlighted unilaterally in this case. Na uh, small nation against big nation. And in that regard, the role of national resistance is soft in a small state, big state conflict. And in fact, U.S. Special Operations Forces have been working with Taiwan on improving their soft capabilities and in incorporating the observations uh, emanating from uh, Ukraine and uh, the tenets that we find in the resistance operating concept. Uh, some specifics in that regard are mobilizing the population led by their, uh, their soft uh, cadres. Educating the people to prepare them for hardship and ensure resilience. We know that logistics matters. It's, it's very interesting to see soft guys talking about how important logistics are. So stockpiling uh, material to defend your nation has become an imperative for small nations in, big, uh, in conflict with big states. And then finally, educating the government on uh, the comprehensive defense concept emanating out of NATO and the approach uh, and that's related to national security. And I'll con conclude with the third implication, which is to NATO and U.S. SOF. Uh, General Edwards laid out several points there, and I'm not going to reiterate those, but I, I will say that the role of uh, SOF is special operations in both integrated or comprehensive defense and during conflict with great power has been displayed to the world. The three Baltic nations plus Poland have been deeply involved in watching and are watching this uh, closely. The key lessons are detailed, uh, uh, are detailed prior planning, actual preparation, not preparation on paper uh, or finger drills, and popular resilience are essential to countering the eventual, not merely possible, national security threat. Soft supports both conventional and traditional special operations in both deterrence and high-end conflict. This is not just about tanks, artillery, ships, and aircraft anymore. Soft is an integral uh, aspect of uh, coherent and uh, comprehensive national defense. And finally, the assorted NATO programs that have been uh, instituted to support Ukraine uh, provided a meaningful uh, capability, but they were incomplete and the reforms were not fully realized. That aside, uh, I think the Ukrainian Defense Forces have acquitted themselves quite well. And I'll stand by for uh, follow-up questions. Thank you, Ike. General Repass, uh, as always, uh, you've, you've, you've over, 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 uh, um, over excelled on the exam question. Thanks so much. You've left me with a lot of questions. I'm probably not going to get to them because I want to get to the open living room Q&A. And first, before that, I want to get to Ambassador Holtz. But a couple of things that, that we're going to get to one way or the other, really speaking to your points on, on resiliency, on resiliency. Uh, we've spoken about it. Uh, General Edwards uh, spoke to it a couple of times of um, lessons gathered, you know, in hindsight being better than 2010, much less 2020 vision, uh, implying perhaps an update to the rock to the um, resistance operating uh, concept coming coming out of as we still experience our support to the Ukrainian forces in the in the war fight itself beginning now beginning now to uh, update that rock with another R in front of the resistance that being resiliency or as George Kinnan might call it uh, strong pointing self 
uh, enduring, uh, enduring allies and uh, anchoring partners, of which the latter Ukraine has certainly proven itself, and then some, uh, an anchoring partner in the, in the, in the Central European region. Uh, speak, speaking of uh, George Kennan, uh, with, with an, an interesting segue in and of itself, let's, uh, let's shift over um, and give some time, uh, some ample time to um, Ambassador uh, Greta Holtz. Um, Greta, uh, microphone is yours. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we, we hear you loud and clear, Greta. Uh, don't have visuals, okay. not your voice wise. So uh, No, so I apologize. I could not hear um, a word of the YouTube video. So I missed that whole amazing presentation. So I turned off my camera because I think I have bandwidth issues here at the house. Certainly. And there's a, a, a lag in what I see your mouth moving, but there's no words coming out. So I apologize. Um, so I'll just go ahead and, yeah, thanks. Go ahead and speak um, without the benefit of having heard that YouTube, but I could hear um, General Rapace um, and I, I echo your uh, thoughts on his presentation. That was like a graduate dissertation in uh, soft special forces, Ukraine, Europe. So very, very uh, honored to have heard that. Um, so coming from the diplomatic perspective, uh, as we continue to compete for access and influence across the globe uh, against a broad and diverse range of competitors and adversaries, the role of our strategic and regional alliances and the U.S. SOF and NATO SOF networks and their core activities, I believe, will remain vital elements of our success. We will need to assiduously integrate all of our national instruments of power and influence in support of our national objectives and those of our partners and allies. Not just in Europe, as General Rapace mentioned, but across the globe, U.S. and partner soft forces are vital in helping us to shape the environment for success and for making our allies face tough choice, or sorry, our adversaries face tough choices. In Ukraine, as you know, we are in a supporting role as a partner to Ukraine in its fight to regain its territory and remain and maintain independence. While we are simultaneously competing with the Russian regime, and I would add China, but since we're talking about Russia, on a strategic scale to ensure a world in which democracy is more secure and global governance is inclusive, effective, and based on a Western-led liberal world order. SOF have incredible advantages working in this quote unquote gray zone type of environment. They've worked for years with their Ukrainian and NATO SOF partners, uh, former Soviet states all along, the border of Russia and across Europe and indeed the globe to help prepare these new NATO soft partners to compete, defend and prevail against Russia. As, as General Pass mentioned, and probably that video that I couldn't see, um, soft strengths are many, starting with the networks and the relationships that they maintain throughout the European security architecture. Ukraine is no exception. As probably was mentioned, for years, the US Special Forces have worked and train side by side with their Ukrainian soft counterparts on foreign internal defense, civil affairs, military information support ops, security force assistance, and much more. Given the role that the Ukrainian soft continue to play against the Russians, I am confident that these relationships and the training have been mission critical and will continue to be so. There's a great need for the capabilities that US SOF and NATO SOF counterparts bring to Ukraine and other new NATO partners, and this will continue into the future. Again, working with and through alliances and partnerships is an essential part of any winning, intended winning solution, and it is indeed an essential part of integrated deterrence. Uh, as has been mentioned, advising and assisting indigenous resistance forces building and maintaining operational networks, building partner capacity, language, cultural knowledge, all of these are soft strengths. Decades of US embassies having soft elements as part of US country teams, working in a whole of government framework across the globe has built better understanding and better ties between US special forces and their interagency partners, the US interagency partners. Um, the soft element in Ukraine before the war was robust, led by a colonel assigned to the U.S. Embassy under chief mission authority, and there was a consistent MIST team presence embedded in the embassy, in addition to multiple special training teams and missions throughout Ukraine. 
The messaging work that the MIST teams do is vital to the success of the Ukrainian war effort and a critical part of our message shaping infrastructure. Special forces and the exquisite skills they bring are a vital part of US government efforts and those of our NATO allies efforts to help Ukrainian and other partner nations build resistance and resiliency against uh, great power competitors and regional threats alike. The US Special Forces and their robust network of partners are a critical part of the integrated deterrence upon which we and our allies rely to prevail in the continuum of war, peace, and competition. So I think I'll end there. It's very uh, broad remarks, but go to uh, Q&A. Uh, over, over, to, over to Dr. Wilson. Ms. Ambassador, uh, Greta, uh, fantastic. Um, you all are making this uh, an, an easy ex ex uh, set of exam questions and, and then some. Uh, and, and, more, and equally importantly, uh, amazingly, we're, we're still a little ahead of target on time, which I love as a moderator. And as you all know, anyone who knows me, I'm, I'm cursed with the gift of gab. So I'm, I'm going to take a couple of minutes of, um, of moderator privilege and just put something on the table as well that that hopefully helps to round out uh, all of our great presentation today. And um, all of us have spoken to this, starting with uh, with the command team from Procure. But really, what we're seeing play out from a from us uh, use utility, and I would say um, rediscovery, a back to our futures uh, approach to a rediscovery of special operations and special operations forces. U.S. and enduring allies and anchor partners, um, special operations forces identity. Um, we see this playing out, uh, unfortunate in tragic real terms, uh, on the stage of the war in in, in Ukraine. Um, it really set up uh, for, and as the sizzle reel up front uh, spoke to, if Afghanistan and the military withdrawal from Afghanistan uh, August of last year might mark historically early history, but a historical mark nonetheless. Um, a uh, ending of soft industrial third age, at least from a, and certainly from a U.S. perspective. Uh, the Ukraine war uh, most likely marks, and histor real historians will, will record this in, in future years, um, as, the, as the clear beginning um, from a field activity standpoint of a fourth age. Uh, what does this look like in terms of preparing for um, soft next hero's journey or this, cro this threshold crossing? I, we here in the Joint Special Operations Universe who have put on the table, and all of you have spoken to this, that the challenge really is striking the right balance, restriking the right balance between leading change, uh, and that change also including change within the, own, the, the soft communities themselves, and leading that change while also preserving and protecting the essence of who special operations forces have been and must continue to be uh, based on what they do and how as uh, soft professionals, first, second, third, and now fourth age. Uh, we offer that soft like the nations that they serve are at, a, an, again, another threshold crossing and one of, of a compounding dynamic of security dilemmas, a new character of, of, uh, of conflict security and defense. Uh, I'd go further and say that the new character of global geopolitical competition demands a use and utility of special operations and special operations forces that are equally compounded to the threats themselves. In fact, overmatching of. What does that mean? At least some comprehensive combination, maybe additive, may not be additive, maybe more than additive, but some comprehensive combination of all the skills, techniques, operational methods, and tradecraft of all past ages of SOF. For the United States, a fourth age, as General Repass put on the table, for the Ukrainians going into a third age, uh, industrial organizational age of SOF. All this amplified by, I would put on the table, at least two things. First, 21st century emerging technology, and second, and more importantly, a uh, 21st century approach to more tightly operationally real and effective, um, tightly coupled, integrated uh, partnering relationships, emphasis on the relationships. Um, I, would, I would conclude my little add-on here that this requires of us nothing less than a back to our futures, philosophy, mind view, and approach to rediscovering SOS fuller role, purpose, uh, and identity. Uh, with that, um, what I'd like to do is, uh, Mike, Greta, maybe give you both a couple of minutes to respond to uh, General Edwards and uh, uh, Command Master Chief's uh, Musselman's comments to respond and react to each other's comments. And, and if you so, 
uh, if you think it's worthwhile to react to what I just put on the table, and then we're going to open it up and conclude with uh, some Q and A. Hey, uh, I just want to pile on something the, the ambassador said that, that uh, really struck a chord. Um, talking about competing for access and influence and uh, soft's inherent advantages in the gray zone. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that will continue to be a theme, I think, uh, as we move into the fourth age of soft. I don't see that going away, quite frankly. And it's not only us, it's also uh, with the Ukrainians and uh, the other forces that we see uh, operating uh, in that region. What I see going on now is the access and placement that we have with our allies and our partners is exceedingly good. Uh, I, I would describe it as rib to rib. Uh, working on logistics and, and operational matters, uh, intel sharing and things like that. Um, <clears throat> the, the thing that I think we, we derive out of this uh, on the U.S. side is access, understanding, empathy, rapport, interoperability uh, are some of the things that we, we get there. But we also thicken the line with our partners and our allies it's not us against the world. It's, it's, it's the big us, the big we, if you will, uh, working together, yeah. uh, particularly in uh, great power uh, conflict. I know that's somewhat of a, a, an old term, but I still think it adequately describes where we're at. What do they derive out of this? They, in this case, the partners of Ukraine, uh, potentially, or the Taiwanese or anybody else. Uh, they're able to leverage other more complex capabilities, such as joint flyers, lift, uh, that means aviation, mm -hmm. intelligence, communications, medical, and logistics. Logistics is basically the, the center of gravity. Actually, the center of gravity is being maintained by the uh, PSYOP programs that are being run, PSYOP and IO programs that are being run out of uh, Ukraine to keep the international community on board and on sides to provide logistics and other support, both political, financial, uh, and in uh, and logistics as well. So let me. Oh, and I, I think uh, we may have uh, had um, general repass drop off briefly. Greta, are you still with us? Oh, and Mike, you're back. I'm still here. I, I my camera's not working, but yes, I want to say that. Um, that I think some of the enduring soft roles, um, whatever age it's in, are things that we really need right now. So it's that network, it's the ability to, um, and, and the, the in my work with the soft, they maintain those networks. Like that's what they value the most, not the most, but at, as a priority is to be able to reach in, have access. And I think as um, as a diplomat and as a you know leader of interagency teams, that has been an exquisite capability for all of us. Mm. The information ops that they do um, brings a lot of capacity to the host government, to the embassy on the messaging. So if they're, you know, if they're um, in some places and in some ways uh, moving from kinetic operations, they'll still do that. But the information space and the access and the civil affairs, that sort of binding of people to government through the CA work that they do, I think these are, are critical elements right now in the type of competition that we face in uh, Eastern, former Eastern Europe and across the Indo-Pacific region. Outstanding. We, op we often talk about the 12 core activities of special operations and special operations forces, core activities, core tasks. Uh, for the last 20 years, in hindsight, we regard that last, for the U.S., a, a third age of soft being the global war on terror era. And we this fourth age going more into an era of strategic competition, not a pivot or a shift as, as General um, uh, Edwards made sure to, to, to account for, not a leaving and a departure of the previous um, period, and most importantly, not a departure from those the criticality of those core activities and tasks, but taking those core activities and tasks, uh, understandably, for the last 22 years, focused on really all the counter operations of the 12, from counterterrorism to counter violent extremism to counter, counter uh, violent extremist organizations, um, uh, uh, combat rescue, et cetera, ex hostage rescue, et cetera, et cetera. 
and then getting back to a fuller complement, a fuller complement of the 12. Um, I get my, my question to both of you is what, what, what does that recon, what are, what are some lessons gathered that we think already that we're seeing in the Ukrainian situation that shows a reorientation, maybe a, 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 a reprioritization of the alignment of those, of those 12 core activities. Seems to me that we've mentioned information operations yeah. and through information, uh, influ informational advantage, uh, employment of uh, in an enablement of influ influence, strategic and operational influence, and a lot of talk about resilience and resistance. It seems to me those may be portending to be the, the new facets of the tip of the spear of, of SOF through integrated joint interagency, intergovernmental, multinational, and commercial partnerships going forward. Uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on, on that and in, a, in what the current fight is actually helping us to gather lessons for the learning employment of, of a prioritization of the, tw of the classic 12. Uh, Madam Ambassador, if you don't mind, I'll jump on this first and then uh, toss it over to you. Sure. Uh, okay. Uh, first That's off, in the, in the information sphere, uh, the strategic communications and IO that are coming out of Ukraine are outstanding. And uh, I'll, I'll say that they've done a very effective job of, of keeping, uh, their messaging coherent, and as a result, NATO cohesive. That's the knock-on effect of, of what they've been able to do. Cohesively, politically, NATO has, has been very strong. Yes, there's internal dissension. Yes, there's debate. Yes, there are outliers. Uh, but cohesively, NATO has uh, has gone forward uh, with one voice and, and concerted action. So they've done very good there. What we don't see... Uh, because we're focused on receiving the IO uh, messaging coming out of uh, Ukraine and our European partners here, what we don't see is what Russia is doing in places where we aren't. We are getting our tails kicked in the non-first world areas, Africa, parts of Asia, uh, Central and South America. Russia is really making hay uh, with their I.O. capabilities down there saying, OK, you know, it's it's really all the grades going to uh, Europe. It's not going to uh, the countries that need it in the Middle East and Africa. They're going to starve you to death. I mean, you can just go on and on. Grains, grains are a big one. Uh, but we don't we, we, that is a blind spot for us. And if we're not careful, we're going to we're going to lose all the progress we've made uh, over the past 20, 30 years in these areas. Uh, and lose our foothold there because Russia has effectively uh, put I.O. campaigns in, in places that matter for natural resource purposes and, uh, I would say, for regional uh, partners and powerhouses. Uh, that's the big one I see. The, the other thing that I see that is, is, is going on is that the uh, Ministry of Interior has the, the um, SBU forces. And they have police powers, and they can do things that the military forces can't do. Um, and they're considered special operations. Within the uh, military intel directorate, they have the GUR, which is considered a military or a uh, special operations force as well. So the blending, or right now they have three, they have at least three distinct stovepipes of special operations. I think uh, they could be on the cusp of blending their capabilities to have a very unique flavor of what special operations is uh, in combination with domestic authorities and uh, extraterritorial capabilities, as well as uh, very magnificent uh, intelligence capabilities provided by the MID. So uh, in that regard, I think we should be taking notes and paying very close attention to the future force structure of Ukraine special operations. Fantastic. Uh, Greta, over to you. Any comments? Thanks. Yeah, I think um, we're we're learning in Ukraine as much as we are giving on the messaging, on the strategic messaging. Like no better messenger than uh, the president of Ukraine, right? We have all learned a lot from him. So I would say that that is important. Um, I would imagine that 
if you're looking at the war and if you're following the news, you, you wherever you are, you see a, a big role for the Ukrainian special forces and their NATO partners, maybe behind the curtain. But I would think this would be a very big growth uh, time for other countries who are worried, not just in Europe, to want to get the kind of training and partnering that our soft forces do on unconventional warfare, resistance, foreign internal defense, all those capabilities, I imagine that it's a, it's a growth time for that. Um, so yeah, I think I, in my opinion, it's hard to tell whether the Russians are winning the info war in Africa, because I think they're also losing a bit as well. I don't know that I could say that I have good data on what your average African citizen thinks about Russia, the grain, you know, I don't know. So I, I know that the uh, country teams, whether or not they're soft there, work very hard to counter the, the messaging that Russia puts out. I, I don't know, I don't have data on that, but I would imagine it's, it's kind of a mixed story. So um, I'll stop there. Greta and Mike, on that point too, um, and I'm gonna go to another question here real quick. Um, this, this, this piece may be where the China piece comes in. You know, I'm intrigued of what, um, admittedly, we still we still have to figure out the right data and how to interpret the data in terms of, of the second order effect and the consequence that you've both spoken to, certainly in the Russia context. You know, we're, we're doing well in the near abroad in the direct traditional sense, but what about what may be exploited by Russia nonlinear, non-contiguously in other regions, Africa, you know, you know beyond the, fir the so-called first world? Um, for lack of a better way of characterizing it. Um, what about China also? This, Greta, you had talked about China earlier. Um, this may be a, a key place where we need to look at how China may be there to exploit, exploit the gray, exploit that gray zone um, uh, that, that, that is uh, indirectly uh, generating out of the contagion of the de facto conflict in, in uh, proximate to the Ukraine. Let me, I, I, we've got a, a couple of other, Great questions here. Let me put one on the table for you all. And then um, uh, this may be, I'll give you both an opportunity to address it. And it goes back to a question that relates to some of the concerns that uh, uh, were put on the table by the SOCUR team. Uh, let me just read the question. The SOCUR command team and other leaders have highlighted the challenge and importance of relationship formation, and notably that it's hard to do after an emergency has occurred. The challenge of small state versus big state seem to imply a much greater reach for these relationships in the context of national resistance. Within the reimagination of the 21st century operating model of SOF, how do you know it's working? Thoughts on that? Wow. I, I wanna be clever here, but- uh, Yeah. That's a stump, that's, yeah, a, that's, a, that's a PhD level uh, discussion, I think. Yeah, you know. Let me, let me, maybe, maybe, maybe let me try to break it down. And, you know, Lord knows you got the, you got the doctor here trying to break it down from a PhD level. So bear with me real quick. I think it gets to, I think this question really at the heart of it gets to what um, General, uh, Major General Edwards and Command Master Chief um, Musselman put on the table of the difficulties of, you know, hindsight being better in 2020. Yeah. Would have, could have, would have, should have. Um, what could we have done in more preventive defense, I might call it, um, pre pre-support and development to include the stockpiling, piling of logistics of service and support materiel for ir irregular, indirect, unconventional logistics, right? Um, once the balloons go up. Uh, likewise, the difficulty of maintaining and leveraging those networks that you both speak to and, and the ambassador most pointedly, how to leverage that and get the most out of it. And might we be, be uh, still only benefiting from the pre-investments in those relationships and now they're at best one degree removed because of some of the of the strategic and policy restrictions of no longer being able to physically be there directly with your with your partner on the ground. So, so one of the things we're missing uh, here is is we didn't uh, cover what the Europeans are doing. Uh, so, some of the nations never left Ukraine. Some of the other nations uh, returned to Ukraine rather quickly after the uh, initial combat phase, uh, as soon as the Russians withdrew from the, the Kiev area. So, so in regards to the U.S., 
it's not like the Ukrainians are uncovered because particularly Poland, Lithuania, uh, and some of the other countries have had a very, uh, I would say, meaningful, not necessarily robust, but a meaningful engagement with uh, Ukrainian soft throughout the conflict. So we, the U.S., are heavily reliant upon our Polish uh, partners uh, who are exceedingly, I would say, central to facilitating what, what Ukrainian soft is doing over there, both logistically and I would say with uh, practical advice and, and help. Uh, and uh, the other nations, uh, Lithuania, Estonia, uh, the three Bs, if you will, uh, providing assistance over there. So we, the U.S., are indirectly uh, helping via Poland and, and some of the other people that have direct contact with them. So, and, and then you get into the technical side that General Edwards talked about, uh, video teleconferencing, uh, phone calls, things like that. That they're taking, uh, and it's you know it's helping to a large degree there, um, and so you know it it's three dimensional chess, and that you have to work with the people that have access and placement. Uh, do you need physical uh, connectivity to achieve the effect that you're talking about, or do you have somebody else that you can do that indirectly through the poles or the Lithuanians that have been there continuously? Uh, that's that's great, Mike. Uh, Ambassador, you get the, the rightful last word, a uh, quick word, and then we'll uh, trans transition it back over to the next panel. Thanks. Thanks. So just uh, going back a little bit to the um, African response to the Russians, uh, if you will recall, when they invaded, there was a UN vote. Uh, I don't remember the exact vote, but a lot of those uh, African countries stood up and said no to invasion. You know, they, they did not like that. That was before, uh, it was right at the beginning when the grain was cut off. So I th think that that is significant. On the Chinese messaging, um, I, in my experience, I see a difference between what the leaders of these countries in Africa want and get from the Chinese versus the people. So oftentimes, you know, the Chinese will use checkbook diplomacy, the, you see it in uh, Sri Lanka, where, you know, they'll support a regime, they'll, the, they'll, uh, the regime will take these bad, very, uh, you know, s difficult loans, and then the people suffer, and then they throw out the people. So I'm not sure that China's message resonates with the citizens of the countries. I don't know, you know, what they're selling. It certainly resonates with corrupt politicians who are not democratically elected and some who are more, you know, everybody wants to do business with China as do we, but their, their strategic message on what is China and what do we bring to you? It's, it's not, I don't believe that it fully resonates with the citizens of those countries. Thanks so much, uh, Ambassador and uh, General Ambassador, thanks to the both of you as well as our um, uh, so SOCUR command team for what we promised, a, a very dynamic uh, Back to Our Futures conversation on the future of special operations and soft through the lens of, of Ukraine, um, past, present, and future. Thank you very much, and we'll turn it back over to the organizers for the, for the forum. Thank you.